Hello, I'm Julia George. This is the Sunday Politics in the South East. And coming up later, should you ever tell your constituents what you really think of them? We talked to the Sussex MP whose colourful choice of language landed him in hot water with the police. Joining me in the studio today to discuss that and other topics, the Conservative MP for Folkestone and High, Damien Collins, and the prospective Labour parliamentary candidate for Dover and Deal, Claire Hawkins. Nice to have you both with us. Thank you. Let's start with East Kent, which includes both of your constituencies, of course, which has made the long list to be a candidate for the City of Culture in 2017. It's one of 11 bidders for the title, which is currently held by Londonderry. Hastings and Bexhill are also in the running, along with cities like Aberdeen and Leicester. At Damien Collins, it's great to be ambitious, but City of Culture? I mean, you're blatantly cheating. East Kent isn't a city, is it? Uh, well, it's a cultural coast, a cultural region, and uh, I think it's got a huge offer of modern and contemporary art as well as the traditional with, with a city like Canterbury. I was discussing this with Ed Vasey, who's the Arts Minister, during the week, and he thinks it's excellent that East Kent has put in for it. He was down to open the Folkestone Triennial uh, a couple of years ago. This is the big arts festival. This is a big arts festival. This will be running it as well in 2017, but we have a wealth of literary festivals. We have the fantastic Marlowe Theatre in Canterbury association with you know people like you know hg wells tracy emin charles dickens you know what else That's quite know, who, who, else, who else can offer that yeah. okay now let's get you claire hawkins to to position yourself like this jeremy birch the leader of labor leader of hastings borough council says that for his area her bidding hastings has become a cultural beacon in the southeast and nationally every justification aiming for this cultural status the town is on the way up he says let the whole country recognize that can you beat that for a positioning statement Maybe not today, but I think it is really exciting that East Kent is going for this. We've got such a range of cultural, artistic and, and heritage uh, venues and sites and, and exciting things that go on in, this, in, in East Kent. But I'd, I'd really like to say that at this time, when we're seeing funding to the arts being drastically reduced through the Arts Council, through local authorities, and at a time when Michael Gove is deprioritising um, art subjects in the, in the way that he is, and we're seeing creativity and expression push to the side, I think it's really important that we are valuing the arts and culture. There I was thinking that you were going to agree on something. I guess that'll be the last point well, of the programme. I, 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 asked, I asked Mark Durkin, who's the MP for Foil, which is a Derry London Derry, for some tips. And he said, well, you know, if uh, his city, which has got two names, can be one venue, then, uh, then <laughs> someone that's more than one venue could be one cultural city. Yeah, you've got his endorsement. Great stuff. Now, it is lambing season, but farms in the southeast are facing a very sinister threat that could undermine livestock and livelihoods. It's called the Schmallenberg virus. The disease, which is carried by midges, causes birth defects in newborn lambs, calves and in goats. It was first detected in the UK last year, and Kent and Sussex are among the areas worst affected. Now, in early spring, there are already worrying signs that it's back. Lucinda Adam has our report. <laughs> It's the sign that spring is here, newborn lambs finding their feet. But after Schmallenberg virus meant thousands of lambs and calves were stillborn or deformed last year, with the southeast the worst hit area, how will this year's youngsters be affected? Good girl. Monica Akehurst lambs 250 ewes at her farm in Hailsham. She had cases of Schmallenberg here last year. It's quite distressing, really, because obviously they're deformed and m most of them were actually dead when they were born, but one or two lived just for a very short time. And it was obvious it wasn't going to be sustainable with life. Um, and so they, they died quite quickly. This new virus has hit the industry at a time when farmers are already dealing with spiralling costs and falling lamb prices affecting their income. And every lost lamb counts. With Smallenberg, there's nothing out there, so <clears throat> even if you're getting large numbers, there's really nothing you can do. You've just got to take the hit, um, which so it's not only has it got an emotional effect, it's also got a um, financial effect as well. The virus was discovered in Germany in 2011 and spread across Europe by midge bites. When it reached the UK last year, Kent and Sussex were the worst affected counties. Ninety cases were recorded by the time lambing ended. This year's lambing season has barely begun, but already 18 new cases have been reported. And this month, the first cases in goats in the UK were found in East Sussex. 
But there's concern that because little is known about the virus, many cases aren't being diagnosed. And because the government hasn't made it compulsory for farmers to report cases, the real spread could be much higher. It's the second day of lambing here at Hockham Farm, and so far all the lambs born have been lovely and healthy like this one. But it's a worrying time for farmers because there's no guarantee that they won't be affected by Schmallenberg again this year. So what's being done to help farmers? A possible vaccine was submitted to the government for licensing in September. Six months on, some farmers say the process is taking too long and needs to be sped up. Really, we've no idea how long that process is going to take. And actually, we've no idea how strong the data are to know whether the vaccine is a, a robust vaccine or not. There is now a blood test for Schmallenberg available. Last year it was free, but this year farmers have to pick up the cost. The government took the view that the industry, the farming industry, will take responsibility for diagnosis and for control. There were other priority areas that they have to spend their money, um, and it's you know tight times as we all know. Farmers who've lost up to half of their newborns to Schmallenberg want more research, more information, and even compensation to help manage their losses. But the government's top vet says they're already doing enough. What more could have been done on the science? There was nothing we could do to stop it, and these diseases that are spread by images are, are very difficult to deal with. So I don't think we could have done any more from that point of view. Um, I don't think farmers really are expecting the taxpayer now to subsidise the cost of the disease for them. I'm sure they'd like it if, if politicians decided that, um, but I, I don't think that that would be the right thing to do. Without a vaccine, experts hope that widespread infection in the southeast last year means animals which were affected have now become immune. But not everyone's convinced. The issue, I think, really is one as to whether there's a degree of complacency on the part of the chief and deputy chief vet and also the scientists from the animal health uh, laboratories. Uh, I think there is a concern that they're relying entirely on this disease wafting across the country that in the second year that there will be an immunity built up. As the lambing season gets underway and farmers wait to see what effect Schmallenberg will have, is enough being done to help them deal with this new threat to their lambs and their livelihoods? Lucinda Adam reporting, well, joining us in the studio is the South East Conservative MEP Richard Ashworth, who's also been a sheep farmer. Uh, Richard, we should be clear first of all, this doesn't, Schmallenberg doesn't affect humans, does it? No, absolutely not. You've been a farmer. What does it do to you to see an animal like that in distress? I mean, for most of us, we know they're going to be meat eventually, they're going to be destroyed eventually. Is yeah. it distressing? Is it emotional? Yeah, farmers are pretty resilient individuals. They learn to live with the weather, they learn to live with diseases and things like that. But uh, a disease like this is just soul destroying. Uh, of course, there's an economic impact, but it's not just the economic impact. You have a, a real care and love of your animals, and you just don't mm. like to see this happening. And Macintosh, there, we heard at the end of Lucinda's report suggesting that perhaps there was a belief that natural immunity would kick in. Um, what's your gut feeling here? Is this going to spread this year? Is it going to be a really big problem or will that natural immunity kick in in the ewes who may have been exposed to it already? I think there is a natural immunity. Um, I think we're still learning. Obviously it's early days but uh, all the evidence is that there would be a natural immunity. And that of course is a significant problem because if you're a vaccine company, a pharmaceutical company, thinking about developing a vaccine, if these animals are going to develop a natural resistance anyway, so they're not going to want it mm. thereafter, mm. how much money are you going to commit? But essentially, if you follow that route, you're exposing the farmers for another year and saying, well, let's cross our fingers and hope that everything's okay. Should there be some support for them this year, whether it's financial compensation or some other sort of support? Well, no, be, be, be clear, that's not happening. Uh, all, all guns are blazing at trying to develop a vaccine. But it's a long process. Uh, you've not only got to de develop it, you've got to test it, you've got to authorise it, uh, and that all takes mm. time. So the authorities, and particularly the European Union, are working as hard as they can to develop a vaccine, but we have to understand it takes time. DEFRA says it is closely tracking the disease, this is directly from the website, but Schmallenberg is not a notifiable disease. Farmers don't even have to report it. How can it be being closely monitored if, it's, if, if there's no obligation to tell DEFRA you've got it on your farm? Well, well, this is the very nature of the disease. Some farms have it and they don't know they've got it. 
it just doesn't show itself. Whereas other farms... But once fall, you do know, surely it should be notifiable at this point, so you really can understand how widespread it is. Well, we, we encourage farmers to report any case so that we know how much, to what extent the, the infection has happened. Um, that is ongoing anyway. But, uh, you know, some farms, I repeat, mm. just don't know they've mm. got it, whereas others can have a very high level, uh, even in a very small flock. There, there was a, um, a, a lot more support last year. The farmers, for instance, didn't have to pay for blood tests. And now in January last year, 11 farms reported cases. But by February, that total was 1,500. It's not really a low-impact disease anymore, is it, as DEFRA's claiming it is? Well, uh, low impact is a sort of technical phrase. Low impact, if you contrast this disease to something like foot and mouth, which is a terminal disease, it actually just stops the industry. Mm, it has mm. massive economic impact for the whole of the country. Uh, Schmallenberg's not in that league at all. Uh, one has every sympathy for farmers who have high levels of Schmallenberg. It is soul destroying. There's a very high level of cost involved. But for the taxpayer, to ask the taxpayer mm. to p meet the bill for that, uh, probably not. Richard Ashworth, thank you very much indeed. Um, let's turn to our guest of the day on this one. Uh, Claire Hawkins, do you agree? Do you think it would be unreasonable to expect the taxpayer to look after uh, our sheep farmers at the moment? Because, I mean, they're suffering already. Lots of them mm. are selling their lamb at, at, at below cost. You're mm. not making any money on it already. Mm. Fee prices have gone up and farmers are, are really suffering at the moment, finding it really, really tough. And I think there has been a lack of urgency and a lack of leadership from the government on this. And I think it is important that as we approach the, the lambing season, as we start in earnest, that um, farmers are given, given the support that they need. Because I think if, if a vaccine mm. doesn't become available, farmers may have to consider whether they can breed again next season or whether they do have a future in, in sheep farming. Uh, Damien Collins, of course, some of the best lamb in the country is produced in your constituency. If a farmer there came to you and asked you to defend the government's position on Schmallenberg, could you? What, what the farmer would want to know is, well, you know, what can we do about this problem? And that's really a the vaccine because it's not like say um, foot and mouth where you look, might control the problem by controlling movements of animals. This is spread by midges, it's spread by insects. It's, it's very difficult to control the way it spreads. Uh, what we need is a vaccine and we obviously we want to see that come on as quickly as possible. Um, but as Richard said in, in his, uh, his answers to your questions, we may have immunity built within the, the lambing stock. The Romney sheep have withstood you know, many things over the years and I'm sure we'll still be going strong after this, this you know, virus passes. Okay, thank you both very much indeed. How frank should you be with your constituents? When East Worthing and Shoreham MP Tim Lawton used the term unkempt in an email, he had no idea it would lead to a six-month investigation by Sussex police. The man in question claimed that his Romany gypsy heritage had been insulted, and he made a complaint. Sussex police told the Sunday Politics that the matter was handled in exactly the same way as if a complaint had been made about any other member of the public. The case was eventually dropped. So... Is this an example of political correctness gone mad or just the police doing their job thoroughly and responsibly? Tim Lawton joins me now from our Brighton studio. Tim Lawton, welcome to the Sunday Politics. Hi. We all deal with people we consider to be a bit difficult at times. Didn't you rather lose your cool? No, I didn't lose my cool and I have to say it's the first time in almost 16 years as an MP uh, that I've been quite as forthright as I, as I was, but I'm afraid the person uh, involved is somebody who has dealt with me over many, many uh, years, complains about uh, everything, is very offensive to all my staff whenever he rings up, has been told not to ring up, continues uh, to do so, and has used very abusive language about all sorts of people on his, mm. uh, on his blog. Um, so this was not exactly a one-off um, incident, I'm okay. afraid. Uh, as well as using the word unkempt, and perhaps we'll come to an interesting idea about what that actually means in a moment, <laughs> you also swore in this email, is it really appropriate, under any circumstances, to swear when you're corresponding with one of your constituents? No, I've never, I've never done that before. There were two instances to this. There was one, it wasn't actually me using the term unkempt, it was the local council mm. who had described the constituent as stuck. Yes, but you said that they were right. <laughs> I said they were um, absolutely justified in using that, uh, that term. And then out of the blue came this charge of racism. Uh, how racism equates with uh, unkempt with a complete mystery to, to me and anybody else who got an ounce of common uh, sense, but that was a major basis of this uh, uh, allegation. And secondly, um, I used some, I would consider it robust language. I don't think it's actually um, swearing, but it was actually language which I took mm. from the blog 
the abusive blog of this very same constituent. So I was actually only doling some of his own language mm. back at mm. him. And that then became the subject of a criminal okay. investigation, no, not, which not, on for six months. Let, let's be clear, it's, it's rude enough that we wouldn't want to say it on air, just in case yeah. anyone's tempted to re-quote it. Um, you're aggrieved by the way Sussex police handled this. Why? What do you think they did wrong? Well, I think there are two things here. And first of all, it's absolutely right that an MP, anybody else in the public eye, should be treated in exactly the same way as any member of the public. But if any of my constituents have been treated the same way as I have, subject to a six-month investigation for something that's clearly vexatious over the hanging of them for all that time, I would have been seeking an interview with the Chief Constable alongside my constituent mm. to take up the cudgels for them. Is so it the, one of, the, one let, me, let me tell you what the two issues mm. are. The first issue uh, is, was it a good use of police time and uh, resources? After an initial interview to get to the bottom of it, to see actually there wasn't a basis for this uh, complaint, common sense should have uh, prevailed uh, and, and we should have drawn a veil over it uh, uh, then. So. Has there an element of political correctness crept into the, uh, into the police, which I think is a complete nonsense? But secondly, there's got bigger implications, which is why I'm raising it for the House of Commons in a few days' time, as to how MPs can communicate with their constituents, particularly those very few problematic constituents mm. who think they've got a God-given right to be gratuitously offensive to MPs and other people in public uh, uh, life. Every time we write back to somebody like that, are we going to get a tap mm. on our shoulder from the Chief Constable? And that raises very serious well, considerations about it, free speech. It does, but it's a kind of a straightforward answer to all this, isn't it? My mum told me not to descend to other people's levels. Didn't your mum tell you that? No, I agree. We can, you can do one of three things. You can um, uh, ignore it, uh, or you can um, reply and, uh, and pan it off. Or you can try and bring it to a close. And I say, my staff have been subjected uh, over uh, many uh, years to, to be a fair, lot of abuse. Th th this man isn't here in, in, to respond to all of that. So let's concentrate on what's happened subsequently. The case was dropped without charge. Mm -hmm. You could just dust yourself down and get over it, couldn't you? Well, there are two points coming out of this, which is what I just, just said, which is why it's got bigger implications for many other people. This isn't just about me. It's, in fact, it's not about me at all. Uh, it's about, are the police now completely subjected to political correctness considerations such that they're spending their time and resources on a complete waste of time, and most people with any ounce of common sense would see this as a complete waste of time, rather than doing the job we, mm. we expect police to do, and that's catching real criminals and preventing crime. And secondly, it's all about free speech, and free speech cuts both ways. And if people want to be gratuitously offensive to MPs or anybody else in public life... You should be able to be gratuitously be, offensive no, back. I wasn't gratuitously offensive, I was robust, <laughs> okay. and I only used language that had been used um, against me and all sorts just, of just, other people. Just very quickly, what, what, I know you've been speaking to the Police and Crime Commissioner for Sussex Case, Bourne. What did she say? Well, I'm not going to uh, discuss a private meeting I've had with the, the police um, commissioner. I told her I am going to be making a formal uh, complaint about the way the police have handled this, at which point it will come onto her desk and she'll decide how to carry it forward. But I just want to make sure this gets uh, an airing. I've waited over six months to go public on this complete um, nonsense. And we need to get real about this. You know, people in, in the world these days, in this country, uh, seem to be afraid of being able to speak their mind proportionately. And this is just political correctness gone wrong. It's a waste of police time uh, and resources, and it has implications for free speech. And we shouldn't have to put up with it, and okay. the taxpayer shouldn't have to fund it either. Tim, thank you very much indeed. Let's turn to uh, Claire and Damien on this one. Claire, would you use language um, like that? I know that some of it we can't say on air. Would you think there's any excuse to use that to a constituent? No, I don't. I think it was very rude, I think it was inappropriate, and I think it was very unprofessional. And I think perhaps before pressing the send button, um, you need to draw some deep breaths, count to ten, and really consider whether that's appropriate. Damien Collins, it's rude and it's unprofessional. What do you say? Well, I think what's unprofessional is the conduct of the police. A six-month investigation into a case like this is absolutely absurd. And I think it's just systematic of the whole human rights culture that came in when the Labour Party brought in the Human Rights Bill, where people feel that if there's anything happens to them they just happen to not like very much, they've got the right mm. to push for a criminal to, to investigation be, into it, and mm. it's totally absurd. To, to be fair, it's not really about that. It's about the McPherson report, isn't it? And this is the quote from um, Sussex Police. And on this issue of in investigating racist incidents, um, it says here, the McPherson report, for the purpose of crime recording investigation, a racist incident includes any incident which is perceived to be racist by the victim or any other person. 
person. In a sense, the police are between a rock and a hard place, aren't they? I mean, I've seen this happen in schools as well. Children called in to see head teachers, logging of racist incidents where two children have been discussing the colour of their skin. But this is clearly not that at all, and there was nothing, uh, there was nothing racist but he in this at all. But he perceived it, and that's yes, what it then, says here. But okay, he but perceived but it The issue here racist. is, you know, are the police duty-bound to spend months investigating any misperception a member of the public has well, as, apparently as a result so. of some correspondence they've had? Well, that is totally absurd, and I think most members of the public would agree that's a complete but waste of police time. But you're the last time. government. This is, this well, no, I'm saying, I'm saying this is systematic of this whole culture that came in with the Human Rights Bill, that if anything happens to you, you happen to not like very much, if mm. someone's rude to you or says something you don't like, then somehow it's an infringement of your rights and you've got the right mm. to go to the police with it, and it's okay. totally absurd. Do, maybe, Claire Hawkins, we need a little bit more plain speaking, even colourful language. Is it so terrible? Would you be offended if someone described you as unkempt? It really just means you haven't brushed your hair, doesn't it? I can see why someone would have taken great offence by oh. the email that was sent. <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed. Now... It is time for a roundup of the week's events in the South East. Here's Lucinda Adam. The Liberal Democrats are in Brighton this weekend as the party meets for its spring conference. It's home to 650 Argyll and Sutherland Highlander soldiers, but how barracks in Canterbury is to close as part of a wider reorganisation of the military by the Ministry of Defence. The Argyles have very much made Canterbury their home, um, so it, it, it will be end of an era. NHS bosses say plans to temporarily downgrade maternity and children's services at Eastbourne Hospital are necessary for patient safety because of staff shortages. Tributes were paid to the former Ashford Borough Council leader Peter Wood, who's died just a week after stepping down because of ill health. Former Labour Transport Minister Paul Clark has announced he will stand to try to win back his seat in Gillingham and Raynham in 2015. In the house. And politicians enjoyed a different type of spin as Brighton DJ Norman Cook, otherwise known as Fatboy Slim, played the House of Commons for charity. There's people in suits who weren't quite sure how to dance, but I think we sort of won them over. Being very diplomatic. We'll come on to dancing in just a second. Um, let's start off with the Howe Barracks. Just a, a quick thought about Folkestone and the support service jobs there. And people are vulnerable, aren't they? Well, I think it's not linked to Howe Barracks, but to a, a reorganisation of the South East Brigade command structure. But I think the key thing for us in Folkestone was the, the long term commitment for the Gurkhas to stay at Shawncliffe Barracks, which has been uh, confirmed by the Ministry of Defence. So that is very good news. And I hope if there are any moves, they'll stay within the MOD. OK. Uh, Claire Hawkins, a quick thought on uh, another prospective parliamentary candidate. has been announced. I think lots of people suspected that Paul Clark would stand again in Gillingham and Raynham. Uh, is Labour Party finding its voice in Kent? Absolutely. I think Paul Clark is a very strong candidate and um, I think for, for One Nation Labour to really resonate with people we need to be having a strong voice in the South East and in Kent. Um, is uh, Norman Cook right about MPs and dancing? Can you dance? Um, no. <laughs> I think he probably is. But that, that competition was something that Mike Weatherly, the MP of the Hovers, organised to give new acts, music acts, mm. the chance to perform in front of senior people in the music industry. I know some bands mm. in Folkestone have been part of it and it's been a great competition. Yeah. It's more to it than MPs. Yeah. Would you dance in public, Claire? Oh, it depend what the music was, yeah? perhaps. You'd seriously give it some thought. Thank <laughs> you both very much indeed. It's been lovely having you with us. That's it for the Sunday Politics in the South East. My thanks again to our guests this week, who were Damien Collins and Claire Hawkins. Natalie Graham is here in the hot seat next week. Now, though, it's back to Andrew in London. See you in a couple of weeks.